Welcome to Shauna May, Book of Kings. Today we continue with the death of Ross Dom. When his father, Obsequies, was completed, Fairmoths gathered an army on the plain and equipped it from Rostam's treasury. At dawn, the tucket sounded and was answered by the din of drums and Indian bells. The army set out for Kabul, the sun obscured by its dust. News reached Kabul's king of their approach. He gathered his scattered army together, and the ground became a mass of iron armor, while the air was darkened with dust. He marched his men out to confront Faramoths, and the sun and the moon were dimmed. The armies met, and the world was filled with the sounds of battle. A wind sprang up, and a dust cloth hid the earth and sky, but Faramoths, at the head of his army, never took his eyes from the enemy king. The din of drums rang out on each side, and Faramoths, together with the small escort, forced his way into the center of the Kaboli troops. There, in the dusty darkness, stirred up by the cavalry, he closed in on the king, and he captured him. That great army scattered, and the warriors of Zabal fell into the retreating men like wolves. They ambushed them from every side and pursued them as they fled. They killed so many Indian soldiers, so many warriors from Sindh, that the dust of the battlefield was turned to mud with their gore. Their hearts forgot their country and their homes. Their wives and their little children were left unprotected. Kabul's king, his body covered in blood, was flung into a chest, hoisted on an elephant's back. Faramas led his men to the hunting grounds where the pits had been dug. Then the king was dragged forward with his hands bound together with 40 members of his tribe. They trust the king so slightly that his bones showed through his skin, and he was suspended upside down in one of the pits, his body covered in filth, his mouth filled with blood. Next, Faramas had a fire lit in which the forty members of the king's family were burnt. Then he turned to where Shagged was still pinned to the plain tree. Shagged's body the tree and the surrounding countryside were consumed by flames that flared up like a great mountain of fire. When he set out again for Zabol, he brought the ashes of Shagid to give them to Zal. Having killed those who had committed this evil, Faramoths appointed a new king for Kabul, as the old king's family had been annihilated. He returned from Kabul, still filled with fury and grief, the brilliance of his days had turned to darkness. All Zabalestin shared his grief, and there was no man who had not rent his clothes in mourning. All of Sistan lamented for a year, and all its inhabitants wore black and dark blue clothes of mourning. One day, Rudabe said to Zal, Weep for Rostam in bitterness of heart, for since the world has existed, no one has ever seen a darker day than this. Zal turned on her and said, Foolish woman, the pain of hunger is far worse than this sorrow. Rudabe was offended and swore an oath, saying, I shall neither eat nor sleep in the hopes that my soul will join Rostam and see him in that blessed company. In her heart, she communicated with Rostam's soul, and for a week, she kept herself from eating anything. Weakened by hunger, her eyes darkened, and her slender body became frail and feeble. Everywhere she went, her serving maids followed her, afraid that she would harm herself. By the week's end, her reason had deserted her, and she was expected to die. When the world was asleep, she went into the palace kitchen garden, and there she saw a dead snake lying in the pool. She reached down and picked it up by the head, intending to eat it. But a serving girl snatched the snake from her hand, and the girl's companions led Rudabe away to her apartments. There they made her comfortable and prepared food for her. She ate whatever they brought her, until she was full. And then her servants laid her gently on her bed. When she woke, her reason had returned, and she said to Zal, "'What you told me was wise.' The sorrow of death is like a festival to someone who has neither eaten nor slept. He has gone, 
and we shall follow after him. We trust in the world's creator's justice. Then she distributed her secret wealth to the poor and prayed to God. O oh, thou who art above all name and place, wash guilt and worldly sin from Rostam's face. Give him his place in heaven. Let him be shown the fruitful harvest of the seeds he's sown. Goshtap's fortunes declined, and he summoned his counselor, Jamasp. He said to him, My heart is seared with such sorrow for this business of Esbandiar that one day of my life passes in pleasure. M malignant stars have destroyed me. After me, Bauman will be king, and Pashutin will be his confidant. Keep faith with Bauman, and obey him. Guide him in his duties, point by point, and he will add luster to the throne and crown. He handed Bauman the keys to his treasury, and heaved a cold and bitter sigh. Then he said, My work is over. The waters overtop my head. I have reigned for a hundred and twenty years, and I have seen no one else with my power in all the world. Strive to act justly, and if you do, you will escape from sorrow. Keep wise men near you, and treat them well. Darken the will, the world of those who wish you ill. Act righteously, and you will avoid both deviousness and failure. I give you my throne, my diadem, and my wealth. I have experienced enough sorrow and grief. He spoke, and his days on the earth came to an end. They built a tomb for him of ebony and ivory, and his crown was suspended over the coffin. When Bauman ascended his grandfather's throne, he acted with decision and generosity, giving his army cash and distributing land among them. He called a council of the wise, the noble, and those experienced in the ways of the world. He said to them, All of you, old and young, who have gracious souls, surely remember Esfandiar's life and good and evil that fate dealt him, and you recall what Rostam and that old wizard Zal did to him in the prime of his life. Openly and covertly, Fairmoth does nothing but put vengeance against us. My head is filled with pain, my heart with blood, and my brain is empty of everything but thoughts of revenge. Revenge for our two warriors, Nushazar and Murmash, whose agonies caused such sorrow and revenge for Esfandiar, who had revived the fortunes of our nobility, who was slain in Zabalestan, for whose death the very beasts were maddened with grief, and the fresco portraits in our palaces weep. Our ancestors, when they were brave young warriors, did not hide their valor in obscurity, but acted as the glorious King Faradon did, who destroyed Zahok in revenge for the blood of Jamshid, and Manacher, who brought an army from Amal and marched against San and the barbarous Tor, pursuing them to China in pursuit of vengeance for his grandfather's death. I, too, shall leave such a tale behind me. When Kay Kosrov escaped from Afrazov's clutches, he made the world like a lake of blood. My father demanded vengeance for Lohasp and piled the earth with a mountain of dead. And Fairmoths, who exhausts himself above the shining sun, went to Kabul pursuing vengeance for his father's blood, and razed the whole province to the ground. Blood obscured all the land, and men rode their horses over the bodies of the dead. I, who ride out against raging lions, am more worthy than any one to take revenge, since my vengeance will be for the peerless Esfandiar. Tell me how this matter appears to you. What answers can you give me? Try to give me wise advice. When they heard Bauman's words, everyone who wished him well said with one voice, We are your slaves. Our hearts are filled with good will towards you. You know more about what has happened in the past than we do, and you are more capable than any other warrior. Do what you will in the world, and may you win praise and glory for your deeds. No one will refuse your orders or break faith with you. Hearing this answer, Bauman became more intent on vengeance than ever, and prepared to invade Sistan. At daybreak, the din of drums resounded, and the air was darkened by the army's dust. A hundred thousand mounted warriors set out. When he reached the banks of the river Hermond, he sent a messenger to Zal. 
He was to say on behalf of Bauman, My days have turned to bitterness because of what happened to Esfandiar and the two worthy princes, Nushazar and Murash. I will fill all the land of Sistan with blood to slack my longing for vengeance. The messenger arrived in Zabol and spoke as he had been instructed. Zal's heart was wrung with sorrow, and he said, If the prince will consider what happened to Esfin Diar, he will see that this was fated event, and that I too suffered because of it. You were here. You saw all that happened, both the good and the evil, but for me you have only seen profit and no loss. Rostam did not ignore your father's orders, and his fealty to him was heartfelt. But Esfandiar, who was a great king in his last days, became overbearing towards Rostam. Even the lion in his thicket and the savage dragon cannot escape the claws of fate. And you have heard Sam's chivalrous deeds, which he continued until Rostam, in his turn, drew his sharp sword from its scabbard. Rostam's heroism in battle was witnessed by your forebears, and he acted as your servant, your nurse, your guide in the ways of warfare. Day and night I weep and mourn for my dead son. My heart is filled with pain. My two cheeks have turned sallow with grief, and my lips are blue with my sufferings. My curse is on the ones who withdrew him, and on the man who guided him to do so. If you can consider the sorrow we now endure, and think well of us, if you can drive these thoughts of vengeance from your heart and brighten our land with your mercy, I shall lay before you golden belts, golden bridles, and all my son's treasures, and Sam's cash. You are our king, and our chieftain are our, our, our flock. We gave a messenger a horse and money, and many other presents, but when the messenger reached when the messenger reached Bauman and told him what he had seen and heard, the king refused to accept Zal's words and flew into a rage. He entered the city with pain in his heart and still revolving thoughts of vengeance. Zal and the nobility of Sistan rode out to welcome him. When he drew near to Bauman, Zal dismounted, made his obeisance before him, and said, This is the time for forgiveness, to put aside suffering and the desire of vengeance. I, Zal, stand before you, wretched and supported by a staff. Remember how good I was to you when you were young. Forgive the past, and speak of it no more. Seek honor rather than revenge for those who have been killed. But Bauman so despised Zal that his words enraged the king. Without further ado, he had Zal's legs shackled, and ignoring the protests of both counselor and treasurer, he gave orders for camels to be loaded with goods in the castle. Cash, uncut gems, thrones, fine cloth, silver, golden vessels, golden crowns, earrings, and belts. Arab horses with bridles worked in gold. Indian swords and golden scabbards. Slaves, bags of coins, musk, camphor, all the wealth that Rostam had accumulated, and such effort are received as presents from kings and chieftains, was collected and taken. Purses and crowns were distributed to Bauman's nobility, and Zabolesin was given over to plunder. Faramos was in the marches of Bost when he heard this. Outraged by the treatment meted out to his grandfather, he prepared to take his revenge. His chieftains gathered about him, and he said, Zavare would often sigh and say to my father that Bauman would seek revenge for the death of Esfandiar, and that this threat should not be taken lightly. But for all his experience of the world, my father wouldn't listen to him, and this is the reason that his territories are now laid waste. When his father died, Bauman ascended the throne and raised his crown to the moon's sphere. Now that he's king, he's once again intent on revenge for Esfandiar and for Murnash and Nushazar. He wants to destroy us as vengeance for their deaths, and he led here from Iran an army like a black cloud. He arrested and bound in chains my revered grandfather, who was a shield to the Persians in their wars, and always held himself ready to serve them. What will happen to our people now? What disasters will close in from every side? My father has been slain. My grandfather languishes in chains. All our land has been given over to plunder, and I am half mad with the grief of all of this. Well, my noble warriors, what have you to say about our situation? They answered him, 
Oh, bright-souled hero, whose leadership has been passed down from father to father, we are all your slaves and live only to obey your orders. When he heard this, Baramoth's heart was filled with longing for vengeance. His head with thoughts of how to save his family's honor. He put on his armor and led his army against Bauman. As he marched, he rehearsed in his mind Rostam's battles. When the news reached Bauman, he acted immediately. He had the baggage trains loaded up, and where he stayed for two weeks, Fairmoths and his cavalry turned the world black with their dust. For his part, Bauman drew up his battle lines, and the shining sun could no longer be seen. The mountains rang with squeals of trumpets and the clanging of Indian bells. The sky seemed to soak the world in pitch. Arrows rained down from the clouds like dew, and the earth seemed to shudder with the din of the battle axe blows, the humming of released bowstrings. For three days and nights... By sunlight and moonlight, maces and arrows rained down, and the sky was filled with clouds of dust. On the fourth day, a wind sprang up, and it was as if the day had turned to night. The wind blew against Faramoth and his troop, and King Bauman rejoiced to see this. His sword drawn, he charged forward, following the billowing dust clouds, and raised such a hue and cry, it seemed that the last judgment had come. The men of Bost, the army from Zabol, the warriors of Kabul, all were slaughtered or fled, and not one of their chieftains remained. All turned tail and forgot their allegiance to fair moths. All the battlefield was strewn with mountainous piles of bodies of men from both sides. With a few remaining warriors, his body covered in sword wounds, Faramos fought on, for he was a lion fighter, descended from a race of lions. Finally, the long arm of Bauman might caught him, and he was dragged before the king. Bauman glared at him in fury and denied him all mercy. While still alive, Faramoth's body was hoisted upside down on a gibbet, and Bauman gave orders that he be killed in a storm of arrows. Pashutin was the king's trusted advisor, and he was very troubled by this execution. Humbly, he stood before his royal master and said, Lord of justice and righteousness, if you desired vengeance, you have achieved it. You would do well to give no more orders for plunder, killing, and warfare, and you should not take pleasure in such tumult. Fear God, and show shame before us. Look at the turnings of the heavens, how they raise one to greatness and cast down one to wretchedness and grief. Did not your great father, who brought the world beneath his command, find his coffin and stand? Was not Rostam lured to the hunting grounds of Kabul, and there destroyed in a pit? While you live, my noble lord, you should not harass those of exalted birth. You should tremble that Sam's son, Zal, complains of his fetters, since his stars will advocate his cause before God, who will keep us all. And think of Rostam, who protected the Persian throne, and who was prompt to undergo all hardships for Persia's sake. It is because of him that this crown has come down to you, not become a Goshtap or Esfandiar. Consider from the time of K. Kobad to that of K. Kosrov. It was because of his sword that the kings were able to reign. If you are wise, you will free Zal from his chains and turn your hearts away from evil paths. When the king heard Pashutin's advice, he regretted the pain he had caused, and his longing for revenge. A cry went up from the royal pavilion. My noble chieftains, prepare for our return to Iran, and stop this rampage of plunder and killing. He gave orders that Zal's legs were to be freed from their fetters, and as Pashutin suggested, he had a tomb built for the slain Faramoths. Zal was brought from the prison to his palace, and there his wife, Rudabe wept bitterly when she saw him, saying, Alas for Rostam, for his noble race, 
Our hero lies in his last resting place, and when he lived, who would have guessed or known that Goshtap would ascend the royal throne? His wealth is gone, his father's now a slave, his noble son lies murdered in the grave. May no one ever know such grief or see the fateful sorrows that have come to me. My curses on them! May the earth be freed from Bauman and his evil father's seed! News of her rage reached Bauman, and Bashutin grieved to hear Rudabay's pains. Her cheeks turned sallow with grief, and he said to Bauman, O king, when the moon has passed her zenith tonight, as dawn comes on, lead your army away from here. This business has grown weighty and serious. I pray that those who wish you evil cannot harm your crown, and that all your days may be passed in joys and festivities. My lord, it would be better if you remained in Zal's palace no longer. When the mountain tops turned red in the rising sun, the din of drums rang out from the court, and Bauman, who had looked for vengeance for so long, commanded that the army be drawn up in marching order. Drums, trumpets, and Indian bells sounded in royal pavilion, and the army set out for home, as Peshutin had suggested. When they reached Iran, Bauman rested at last, and sat himself on the imperial throne. He gave himself to the business of government, distributing money to the poor, and some were pleased with his reign, while others lived in grief and sorrow. Bauman now, also referred to as Ardashir, had a son called Sassoon. He also had a beautiful daughter named Homei, with whom he fell in love and he slept with her. According to the custom called Pallavi, when Haname was six months pregnant, Bauman became ill, and realizing he was going to die, he resigned his throne to Home and her heirs. But when Sassan heard this, in rage and shame he fled to Neshapur, forsook his fame, and inconspicuously lived out his life. A well-born local girl became his wife, and she in time bore him a son, who he named Sassoon, too. Then unexpectedly the elder Sassoon died. The son was wise, but poverty obscured him from men's eyes, and as a shepherd he was forced to keep. The king of Nashapur, rich flocks of sheep. From this lowly shepherd would come the last of the great pre-Islamic dynasty of Iran, the Sassians. And here I end my tale for today. But I'll be back tomorrow with more tales, many more tales. Until then, my friends.